Good morning, East Point. Thank you for braving the storm and coming in. It is now time to praise the Lord. You make a way when I cannot see. You are my strength. Though my heart is weak, you won't let go. You take my place on this battlefield. You go before. You're my sword and shield. Fight. It's 
sends Goliath to his knees. And I've seen his praise unravel shackles right off my feet. Cause that's the power of your name. Just a mission makes a shaken because you are fighting for us and you have won teach us to rest to lay down our weapons to trust in you you are perfect and you are holy you are so good god thank you that you are moving mountains for us you're parting seas that you're making a way for us there's no one like you jesus there's no one like you jesus Without your love, 
slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross you have won me with your kindness chase me down when I was lost where would I sunny day. Makes you wish you could really have some blowing snow. <laughs> hey, Jesus told his disciples this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Meditate on that for a minute. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I love that Jesus gave us instructions so we don't have to try and figure out what we ought to do. And just like that declaration that he mentioned, we want to see the Holy Spirit active in each one of us individually as East Point, 
We want to see it activate us and empower us to go out into greater Portland, into New England, and then into the whole world. That's what we're here for, to see that continuing to go. And I was praying the other night, though, because sometimes things don't happen as quickly as I would like them to happen. And, and consequently, I get frustrated because of my impatience. And when I get frustrated, then my mind goes off of the kingdom, and it, it gets derailed somewhere. And, and God gave me this while I was praying. He said, the faith I will give you is not a prisoner of time. I said, oh, that's good. Because what he's saying is, I just need to continue to be obedient and walk with him. And he's going to make everything happen. It's his power in us that does that. And uh, look at that. Let's try to get that back. Okay. See, it's hard to hold on to this thing. So as we as the church continue to bring his kingdom into the, all the nooks and crannies uh, of the people and the places that we have influence, bringing glory to Jesus, which should be the main reason we gather, we want to do that, and we want to be equipped for that kingdom influence and your support of that mission is also, it's taken place not only around here that we're used to, right? In your workplace, in your family, in the school, at the, at the club, all of those things. But you, maybe unknowingly, know that you're supporting that mission globally. You just might be a little bit unaware of it. So I just want to bring you a little bit up to date on that. We're partnering with Team Expansion, and you've seen the president of Team Expansion here a couple of years ago. And uh, they've got workers all over the world, and our mission with them is we're supporting different areas financially, but we've also got a special mission where we want to get with, um, we want to have a couple of workers train and go into an island up in northern Europe, and I'm being especially vague about that because there's safety issues when we send workers into these particular places. So over there, there's an enclave of about 30,000 folks that came out of East Africa. And they're not Jesus followers, and they're pretty much unreached. And we want to send some people in there to be a part with them. Um, the way we do that is through what we call disciple-making movements. And that's what's being done all around the world. Uh, characteristics of a disciple-making movement are that it grows fast, that it uses indigenous people in the culture, that it multiplies groups, and that it creates obedient Jesus disciples, dis followers or disciples. Team expansion just last year, so this is just one organization, started over 1,000 new groups, and they have about, had about 4,000 baptisms just last year just through the team expansion groups. There are now about 5,200 multiplying groups just through team expansion, let alone the millions that have come through all the other organizations um, around the world. And these multiplying disciple-making movements, once they get started, it's like a fire. And it just keeps going and going and going. And generations of these groups end up being formed. So our partnership with them East Points with uh, Team Expansion, we are in uh, Western Africa uh, helping to support some folks there. We're also in Eastern Africa helping to for support, support folks there. We've got a team in Kenya being trained to go up to that large island in Northern Europe um, and so that they can go and make those disciples. And really what it looks like is these places go into different villages or cities, they prayer walk, they just wait for God to present a person of peace, doesn't need to be a believer, and through them they begin a group that they do a discovery Bible study, and they begin to multiply from that time, and the Holy Spirit actually guides them and gives them what they need to have. Now, we have uh, no short-term opportunities at this time. A lot of folks want to get involved in that, and that's great, and at some point um, maybe we would come to, to see that. Um, Go ahead and put the slide up there, Isaac. So this is uh, an example of a discovery Bible study that is actually happening in Western Africa that I got to be a part of. And uh, a little bit different atmosphere, maybe in your regular life group, We're sitting under the mango tree. And there were a couple of herds of cattle that actually came on uh, through there as well. And it's about 100 degrees. And everybody in there makes about a buck a day, probably. That's, that's their income. Um, and to that, to get that going, what they had was uh, 
uh, groups of uh, regional workers and city workers, and they would all go out in motorcycles and, and iPads, and, it's, and they would just go and they would pray, and God would present them with people. The people would, would come, they would be, start groups on their homes, and they would just start to multiply. And these are people who normally would have been hostile toward Christianity. But God is continuing to work through them. So one of the things that's stopping us moving into that northern European country is COVID, obviously, which has kind of put a cramp on many things. And then we need to get visas to get those guys in there as well so that they begin moving along that culture and showing those folks Jesus. Um, you know, when you do give, and we call these generosity moments, it's more than generosity. We're on mission that he might be known by everybody and come into that place of intimacy with Jesus that he calls us to. Intimacy followed by power, which he wants to give us. So let me pray for us today. We got three ways to give at his point. We can give with the giving boxes in the back. We can give online and we can give with the giving app. So let me pray for us. Father, I just thank you for your goodness and for the generosity that you've created here that transformed missions all the way around the world and we just pray that the multiplication would happen more and more but father we really pray that strongholds will be broken over us here so that we can see differently that we can have a veil removed from our eyes that you would encourage us that we are filled with the power of your spirit so that we can go and make those changes both at east point amongst ourselves, encouraging one another for, toward love and good deeds, that we can go out into greater Portland, that we can go out into New England, that we can go out into the world, Father, and make more and more disciples, giving glory to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Character isn't built in comfort. It isn't something you're born with or aspire to. It's not something you can buy or travel to find. Character is forged in the flame of adversity, in the fire of tension and hardship. It's a consistency that is cultivated, the sum of small actions compounding one on top of another, the evidence of a life transformed. Certain things in life will test the depth of your character. When that happens, at that exposing moment, what will be revealed? What will the world see of you? Hey, good morning, church family. How are we this morning? Sounds real great. How are we this morning? Hey, I've, I've got to apologize. Some of you may have heard the storm is named after me. It was Storm Keenan. And just a quick story. Back in 1991, Hurricane Bob. Anybody remember Hurricane Bob? I don't. Because on the 18th, as it was traveling up the Carolinas, heading towards New England, my grandfather was proudly standing on the deck of his sailboat with my uncle, sharing a cigar and welcoming in his first grandson into the world. So me and those uh, hurricanes and storms might have a thing going on. So I'm sorry. Caused damage however many years ago. And then plenty of storm yesterday. So I'll, uh, I'll just make sure I'm on my knees a little more with the Lord and God, I can't have that as part of my reputation. <laughs> so I just wanted to welcome you. Thanks so much for joining us in person. If you're online, thanks for being with us as well. We uh, just want to really jump right into our character building, building character series today. And so before we get into it, this is a, this is a story about a very familiar, powerful leader that God appointed, inspired, and led through that could be some pretty heavy stuff. So I just want us to, to be able to take a time to lean back in our chairs, take a couple deep breaths with me if you could, a, a breath in, a breath out. And just to know that wherever you've come from this morning, 
the driveway with a shovel in your hand, maybe a long week like me, or maybe an exciting week, maybe a, a ton of wins, a ton of goals. Wherever you're coming from, you're welcome here. And we pray that you find a space to be able to rest, space to be able to collect yourselves, and a space to be able to encounter Jesus this morning. So I'm just going to pray for us. You know, we can just close our eyes and try to picture Jesus looking right back into your eyes, meeting you right here in this moment. You can open your hands, release anything you're trying to hold on to, and I'm just going to pray for us. Father, we invite you in this space this morning. We invite your son Jesus to make himself new to us again in a, in a way that we've never experienced maybe, and that your spirit would come on us, lead us into wisdom. May it be your word that goes out, not mine. And may you speak to us this morning, Lord, that it's not by our might nor our power, but by your spirit that we go from here. In Jesus' name. So the prophet Zechariah in the fourth chapter of the book found in the Old Testament says this very thing. He says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And this was given to him in a vision that he was caught up in. And it's a, just a timeless truth that God through the ages has always desired for us to not live our lives as his people by our power or our might, but by his spirit. And our character this morning exemplified that in and throughout his entire life as we see in the scriptures. But before we get to our character, just to recap, because it's helpful for context, we wound up last week with, with Joseph and his whole family back together. But they weren't, they weren't back together where they came from. They're actually back together in Egypt. They're back together, good buddies with this king, all the prosperity and provision they could ever need. But in a moment, not unlike today, when the administrations change, the rulers in charge change. How many know that somebody can go from first to worst real quick? And not only did, did Joseph go from first to worst, the entire nation of Israel became enslaved. Manual labor. Because the new king, Pharaoh, was a little scared at how fast they were multiplying, how much influence they were gaining, and he tried to fix it by just putting them to work. Backbreaking work. And you can see through the scriptures in Exodus what they experienced. But we're going to fast forward through a very familiar character named Moses, who again is not our character today, but it's important for context because Moses becomes this fearless leader of Israel. And many know the, the murder scene, the burning bush, the, the power struggle with Pharaoh and God and the plagues. And finally, the reality that Pharaoh understands that I can't win against this God. So I'm going to let the Israelites go. Let my people go, says God to Pharaoh. And finally, he said, I probably should because this isn't, win this isn't working out. So as Moses leads the Israelites out into the wilderness, they go through the Red Sea. They encounter falling birds and bread, the quail and the manna. They, they get clean water by the drop of a stick. All these miracles are happening around them. And Moses is leading the Israelites, but there are people watching. And one of them, is our character today, and his name is Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun. He was thought to be about 40 years old at the time of the Exodus, and he quickly became one of Moses' right-hand guys. An intelligent leader, a strong warrior, faithful servant, all are noteworthy characteristics. But this morning, I just want us to focus our attention on his ability to say, not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. That is the life that Joshua lived. So we're going to jump into the first scene in the scriptures where we see Joshua in action, but very early on in his relationship with God. So in Exodus chapter 17, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I'll stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. 
So this is the first real battle that we see the Israelites going against a, a tribe that's in this wilderness region that they're exploring. And typically we would have this battle formation and we're gonna, we're gonna strategize. The Israelites are gonna figure out how to attack. No, Moses said, I'm just gonna grab my staff, go up on the mountain, God's got this. But Joshua's the one on the ground. Joshua's the one that doesn't even maybe realize that it's all about Moses' arms. So they're warring, the Amalekites are winning and then the Israelites are pushing back against them as Moses' arms are going up and down. So Aaron and her probably getting a pretty good perspective of what's going on, said, we got to get this guy's arms up. And so they shored his arms up, held him up, blocked him up, anything they could do. And the scriptures tell us, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, don't miss this. Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses, don't let Joshua miss what just happened. Don't let Joshua miss the fact that I did this, that it was not by his might nor his power, but by my spirit. So this is Joshua's first encounter. Maybe you're just reading the account saying, huh, maybe there's something about this Lord, about this God that's leading us that I need to pay attention to. And how many times as followers of Jesus or people that just live in this world, this broken world, do we realize maybe there's something else afoot? Maybe there's someone, maybe in our, in our hearts it's Jesus. Maybe if we're not followers of Jesus, we're saying there's something going on that I need to pay attention to. Well, this is a moment for Joshua. And then Moses began leading Joshua in a new way. Not allowing him to go out and fight battles, but also inviting him into his personal relationship with God. And it was quite traumatic. So as the Israelites were being led in the early days of their exile from Egypt by Moses, Joshua got to see what it looked like to lead from a place of knowing God. See, Moses invited Joshua, his right-hand aide, up the mountain, up Sinai Mountain, Mount Sinai, to meet with God. And though Joshua stayed back, he could still see a portion of the holiness and glory of God as Moses approached God himself. Joshua was also at the tent of meeting where Moses and God would meet face to face and talk to each other as if they were talking as friends. You see, Joshua got this insight into what it looked like to know God. And so this morning, I just want to point out with the first point, that by God's Spirit, by His Spirit, we can know Him just like Joshua, just like Moses. We can know Him. And Joshua was getting a taste of what that looked like, getting to see God's glory, getting to hear from Him, getting to be inspired in the heart that this God of Israel was relational, and He still is today in 2022. He desires for us to meet with him. He desires to speak to us as if we're talking to a friend. Who here believes that? Do we believe that this morning, church, that we can talk to God like we're talking to a friend? But also, as we get to know God, he might actually invite us to do something for him. This is where the rubber meets the road. And Joshua experiences this. As the Israelites are being led by God, by the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, he leads them to a place called Canaan. Not Kenan, not my name, not the storm's name, Canaan. He told Moses in Numbers chapter 13, he said, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So Joshua, being the member of the tribe of Ephraim, joined the other 11 leaders and went into the hill country of Canaan. Now they went around spying, understanding who the people were in this land. They were grabbing the fruit, testing the soil, trying to understand what this land was that God may be delivering them into. Quick note, if you live in Scarborough, South Portland, Gorham, any of these, do not do this. 
God is not inviting you into your neighbor's backyard to covet their 1,400 square foot home, two car garage, and test their cucumbers. Okay, that is not what's going on here. This is a moment where God is inviting them and telling them, this is the land I have for you. Now go test it out. Take a look at it. But God may have known what was going to happen next. When they returned from their 40-day mission, the leaders said to the entire assembly, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. So they continue just telling and sowing seeds of, of doubt amongst the entire tribe, of, uh, amongst the entire people of Israel, saying, there's no way we can take it. There's no way we can step into it. They've got giants. They've got fortresses. They've got everything that they need to defend against us. We can't take it. And they sowed seeds of doubt and it spread like wildfire. And when it did, Joshua and his pal Caleb, who were a part of the initial send out of the 12, are recorded doing this. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Joshua and Caleb, regardless of their own fears, other people's thoughts of how they looked or act, they didn't care because they knew who God was. They knew who he was. They knew the language here was their protection is gone. Gone because God has declared this is our land. Joshua knew who God was. He knew who he served. And he was so confident. He was willing to put out everything on the line, including his own life. And the assembly wanted to stone them. But he was willing to say, this is the God we serve. And this is what he has for us. So my second point, by his spirit, we can trust him. We can trust God. So many of us have come maybe from backgrounds where we're going to keep God at an arm's distance. I'm going to do my thing. I'll let him do his thing. Maybe I'll go to church. Maybe I'll sign up for one of those small groups. But at the end of the day, what I really want to do, what makes me feel good, what makes me feel like I have purpose, that's mine. Let me tell you, we can trust God. Even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's a little fearful, we can trust him. And we have to trust him out of a place of knowing him. Many of us know what happened next to the Israelites. This was far more costly than just disagreeing with those that, the 12 that were sent out or disagreeing with Joshua and Caleb. The people of Israel disregarded them and God punished the entire nation for 40 years. Punish them not for a time span, but punish them because the initial generation would need to pass away and die off before the rest of Israel could re-enter the promised land. It's costly when we don't follow the Lord. It's costly when we don't trust in him. It's costly when he has purposes and plans for us and we don't step into it with him. So fast forward, Moses, like the rest of the generation of Israelites, was going to pass off before they ever stepped in the promised land. But Moses knew the people of Israel were chosen by God to be his people. So Moses also knew that they had to have a leader. And that leader was going to be Joshua because he knew God and he trusted him. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 34, the author writes that now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had. Did what the Lord had commanded Moses. <clears throat> in the final chapter, 
In the first chapter of the book of Joshua, God tells him right after this moment being laid hands on by Moses, God speaks directly to Joshua. And this is a pivotal moment in Joshua's life and should be in this story for us. God says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is God speaking to one of his sons. This is God encouraging his heart, knowing there's gonna be difficult things, but he has a path and a purpose and a plan. But hear me on this. He's not saying, Joshua, you've got it all. You got everything you need. Your tool belt's filled. Just go do it. Give it your best effort. Why don't you just try really hard and we'll see how it all plays out. God is saying, no, I have a way for you to move forward. I have a path for you to walk in. Don't turn to the left or to the right so that you'll be successful. Meditate on the law. Meditate on my word. God's saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, Joshua, you will be successful. We can't do it on our own either. We can't muster up within us and fabricate what abiding might look like. We can go to all the church services. We can go to all the Bible studies. We can do all of the ministry in Jesus' name we want. But if we're not being led by his spirit, if we're trying to do it in our power, in our might, We can't. I can't. None of us can. Only by him. And for us, where do we understand his commands? Where do we understand his wills and his ways? Where do we understand the character of God? It's in the word. It has to be in the word. And we're not even limited like Joshua was to the Torah, the the original law and the tablets that were all laid out in their exodus. We not only have all of the Old Testament, we have the gospels, we have the ways and words of Jesus, we have the epistles, the letters from the early church fathers themselves. We even have the book of Revelation that tells us how it's gonna end. But I think for us, a lot of us just close it up and say, hey, we're good. I've got my seal, I've got my ticket, I'm good. Here's my fire insurance, wanna see it? I even have the t-shirt. God says, by my spirit. We have the inspired word of God as the bedrock for our souls. And he tells Joshua, day and night, meditate on it. May my words be on your lips. How many of us take that serious? How many of us are ravenously learning the word of God, allowing it to saturate our souls, becoming inspired by his spirit to walk in his ways? Because that will prevent us, trust me, from turning left or turning right, by walking in his ways. Jesus says, narrow is the gate, difficult is the road, but it leads to life. This is what God's inviting Joshua into. So my third point, by his spirit, we can obey him. Only by his spirit can we actually live a life of obedience to the God of the universe, the one who created you, the one who who wired the DNA in every single one of you. If you even just look at creation in itself, you would just wonder at who has done this, the power of God. He says, I want you to walk with me. Be obedient. Follow me. I have good things for you. And he does this with Joshua. And yet, Joshua's human, just like you and I. And so Joshua, as he's leading the Israelites, 
He takes him across the Jordan River, split much like with, with Moses. Joshua has a successful campaign initially against a very familiar town named Jericho. God gave them the greatest, most strategic battle plan ever. He said, grab your hiking shoes, your, sh- your, hiking shoes, your tambourines, and your singing voices, and the city's yours. Just how I draw it up. But Joshua trusted him. They marched around the city seven times, let out their final shout, and the walls came crashing down. He obeyed, and God came good. But the Israelites, all it took was one person in the camp to take home the wrong belongings in disobedience to what God had said before the battle, and everything came undone. When the Israelites face the next military um, battle, attack, they said, these guys are easy. These guys are weak. We just got to send out a few of our contingents. They'll take care of them. And in an instant, the Israelites were running back, beaten, broken, and had loss of life. And Joshua didn't lean into his power, didn't lean into his might, but he fell on his face, pursuing the Spirit of God and said, God, What has happened? And so after suffering this defeat, Joshua recognized that the Lord wasn't with them and that he needed to get back to the Lord. So as Joshua's on the ground before God, the Lord spoke in Joshua chapter seven. He says, then the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded to keep. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Somebody had taken spoils of war back into the camp of Israel. And it wasn't Joshua. But corporately, church, God honors us corporately. We all get so caught up in our individualism. We get caught up in, well, I'm just good. I think I'm good. We're all good. God sees us as this collective, beautiful bride and body of himself. And when we invite these things and disobey God, we not only do that to ourselves, but we can tarnish the church, the body. And this is what's happened to Israel. So what did Joshua have to do? He had to seek them out. They had to identify who it was. And there were dire consequences for the sin. You see, we don't handle sin in no way, shape, or form in regard as God does. When God looks down on us and sees this active rebellion in our lives against him, he doesn't smile. He doesn't smile. Romans tells us, for the wages of sin is death. And I don't know if we believe it. I don't know if I believe that deeply as God would have me believe it, because I would be trembling and pursuing him in a whole new way if I did. But the Israelites knew there had to be bloodshed for the sin that was committed. But praise God that he was merciful enough and gracious enough to pay the price himself. Because later on in Romans 6, the word tells us but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Jesus, he paid the price. Through Jesus, he makes us righteous. Not by might, nor by power, but by God's spirit, we are made righteous. And by his spirit, we come to repentance. By his spirit, we recognize what's happened in our lives. We recognize and we don't, like like Joseph, when he was running out of the room because the, the, the king's wife was trying to drag the robe off him, he ran for the hills. And do we do that very same thing? Do we fall like Joshua on our knees and say, Lord, I've done this against you. I've done this against my brothers and sisters. Or we just try to manage it? Do we just try to maintain it? If we try to manage and maintain our sin, Many people think it's a little pet that you can just stroke and say, oh, that's okay. I'm going to just keep you here and feed you and and handle you. No one will find out. It's more like a 300-pound tiger that you have by the tail in your living room. It just does not work out. 
For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have so many good gifts in our lives. We have family, we have jobs, we have provision, we have, we have success. We have this warm space that we can all gather in on a Sunday morning after a snowstorm. They're all good gifts. But you know what the greatest gift is? Jesus, his gospel. It's the only good news. Why? Because we remain apart from him, unholy and broken and not put together. But because of what he did, the life he lived, the cross that he died on, the grave that he rose from, he washes us white as, white as snow, <laughs> brings us into the very presence of God and says, here's my brothers and sisters, Father. Look at them. They're perfect because of what I've done. This is the gospel. And I must say that the gospel is not as good if sin is not as bad as it really is. If we don't have bad news in our life, why do we need good news? And we have to reckon with that this morning because we can lose our life. The wages of sin is death. Many people might be in many different places this morning. My heart personally is broken because of what I've encountered. But that brokenness is nothing compared to the glory that comes when Jesus reaches down in our mess and says, let me pull you out of this because of what I've done and I'm gonna present you to my Father. Redeemed, righteous, clean, and you see, many of us look at a character like Joshua and we say, man, I wanna be like Joshua. He seems like such a good dude. Newsflash, none of us are gonna be like Joshua. As much as we're gonna try, as much as we're gonna might, as much as we try to lean in, we aren't meant to be Joshua's because Joshua was a foretaste for Israel of the one that was to come. Joshua in Hebrew, is Yeshua, which means he saves. And Yeshua in Greek is Jesus. Just as much as Joshua continued the work of Moses, leading the people of Israel into the promised land, Jesus grabs our hands and says, you are my people and let me lead you into the ultimate promised land. And as we step across that river, as we step into new life in Jesus, Jesus says, don't you dare think you're gonna fight your own battles. I will fight your battles. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. He saves, we don't. He marks us with his Holy Spirit. And he says, you better listen because he has life for you that you have no idea about. And so many of us will settle for what this world offers. And let me tell you what, it's nothing compared to the abundant life in Jesus. When we hear from him, when we walk with him, when we do the work he has for us, there's a life beyond anything we could ever ask or imagine. And it's so good. But when we choose to walk away from him, when we choose to walk right or left, there is destruction. But it's not irredeemable. It's not irredeemable because what he did for us is enough. It's sufficient. And so this morning, just as we started in prayer, I wanna end in prayer, but end in a place the reality that we need him so desperately. Because we can worship, we can sit and listen, we can take notes, we can do the church thing. But if we don't remember him, if we don't honor what he's done for us, we're bankrupt. We drift so easily. And I pray this morning that it just saturates our soul that he falls afresh on us in a new way this morning. And it might lead us into a place of repentance this morning in prayer. That's a good thing. That's a gift. That's a pathway back to him. 
It might lead people into the baptistry this morning. Don't sit another day on the wrong side of the river as Jesus leads his people into the promised land. Receive the gift that he saves and it's by his spirit. So we can just open, don't take it yet, but let's just open the communion cup and the cracker. Let's just go back to a place of closing our eyes, of taking a deep breath and staring into the face of Jesus. The one who's led us into new life life of abundance. And he's inviting us to come to him, even if we're weary and heavy laden, because he'll give us rest. He's humble, he's gentle at heart. Look into his eyes and just thank him for what he's done. And lay down anything that might lead you to destruction. And let him well that up and we just lay it at the foot of the cross. And as he stares upon you, he can look into your soul and say, it is finished. Lord, we thank you for this gift. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for what you've done, Jesus. It is all about your gospel. It is all about what you've done for us. It is not me saves, it is he saves you save, Lord Jesus. And may we live a life not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So we can take the bread and remember what Jesus did on the cross for us, his broken body, broken for you. And we can take the cup, a cup of a new covenant, a new promise to the people of God, no longer Israel alone, but all of us who recognize that it's his blood and his sacrifice that restore us back to God. We remember Jesus. And if we need to take a moment and settle in our seats and really reckon with some of this, that's okay. That's okay. But if we rise to worship, may we worship in a new place. May we worship at a place of desperation for him. May we worship him with everything we have and give him all the glory for what he's done. So if you're willing, you can rise with us and worship.
originally from Maine. I grew up in the church and honestly lived a rather boring life until recent years. I am a survivor of domestic violence. It is truly devastating and confusing to be harmed by the person who is supposed to love you. Jesus tells us that we're gonna experience um, suffering here on earth, but he also tells us to take heart because he's overcome the world. And I'm learning to receive that peace in knowing that he's already won the battle. About a year and a half ago, my friend invited me to a women's Bible study here through East Point, and it has been a life-changing experience for me. I now have an amazing group of sisters in Christ, something I've never had before, and I'm truly grateful for them. A few months ago, I was having my chair time, and I felt God was really revealing himself to me. I felt like he was telling me, Erica, I got you. I realized that I had been trying to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. And he has given me the strength and the endurance and the grit to overcome the many obstacles that the enemy has sent my way to try to steal my joy and tear me down. This month marks one year of sobriety for me. I wanted to get baptized as a symbol of a true rebirth. God is blossoming me into the woman he created me to be. I'm excited for him to use my story to bring glory to his kingdom and to be a beacon of hope and light to others. My name is Erica Dunn and today I declare Jesus as Lord. Church, do we believe that this morning, that he's led us out of Egypt? He's led Erica out of her Egypt and into the promised land, and she's gonna experience the abundant life. And did you hear what she said? Jesus will fight her battles. Jesus fights battles for us, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. And as Joshua looked into the future of Israel, an old, old man, this is the words he had. 
for his people Israel. And these are the words for us this morning, church. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And church, this house, this house will serve the Lord. This church family will serve the Lord in this region for his glory, for his namesake, and by his spirit. So be sent, be sent out as his people to declare his good news, his gospel. If you need to be prayed over, if there's something that's just welling up inside of you, run. Run under these screens, meet with the people here to pray with you. And if you want to today declare that Jesus is Lord, you come and meet us at the curtain and you can get in that same baptistry. New life in Jesus as you come out of those waters. If you wanna know more about who we are as a church, you can join us in Discover East Point. But otherwise, declare today who you will serve because in this house, we will serve the Lord. Have a great Sunday. We love you all. Have a great day.